Thanks. Um, first of all, um, who in the room is already running CFS file system just to get a rough overview? Okay, some of you. Um, so this talk is probably not for you. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, when I thought about uh, giving this talk, uh, we were in a situation, well, um, let me put it this way. Uh, I grew up over the years as an LDISCFS luster guy, and uh, only recently I got uh, dropped the CFS in my lab, uh, which opened up new possibilities, uh, but, well, I knew nothing, nothing about uh, this file system, so um, uh, I we had to, to learn about CFS-specific CFS features as we were going, and I think quite a number of you will be in the same situation, having a good understanding of Lustre, of the, the LDISC FS uh, backend, but probably not so much knowledge uh, about CFS, and well, so I thought this would be a good possibility to just go and share our experiences of going this route and so maybe publicly shame myself as uh, giving a CFS-based talk uh, and knowing essentially nothing about CFS. Um, well, who are we? Uh, I'm working for Science and Computing. We're an IT service company uh, based in Germany in several locations, and uh, our main customers are from the automotive industry where we operate HPC environments uh, in technical computing. Um, we're, uh, we've been acquired by Bull in two 2008 and nowadays we're part of the Atos group uh, due to the acquisition of Bull by Atos. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the main thing you, you need, to need to know about uh, this background. Um, we've got employees, we make money and we sell products and mostly IT services. So, uh, what's our use case? Um, as I said, we grew up, of course, in the Luster LDISCFS world, and for one of our clients, uh, we had a pretty old, uh, our, actually our very first uh, Luster file system, which was uh, initially built in 2007 and uh, grown over time. It's based on Luster 1.8, or it was based on Luster 1.8, and uh, it was running on JBot hardware uh, by Sun at the time, and this hardware ran out of life. Um, the initial setup was uh, LDISCFS on top of an MD RAID setup, and this hardware was really crappy. Uh, we experienced frequent drive failures, uh, and on the system I learned more about MD RAID than I had hoped I had to. Uh, just uh, really manually fixing uh, stuff and getting um, uh, getting MD RAID sets uh, up and running again after severe crashes and uh, this is the only system where I really experienced uh, a RAID 6 setup, 8 plus 2 RAID uh, failing uh, with three drives uh, successively, so, so really a multi-drive failure that essentially brought the whole RAID array down. Um, and yeah, the sort of real life issues that you face are the crappy storage management softwares you get with your uh, JBots uh, that are based on Java version that you that is no longer maintained and that only runs well with some really ancient Java, Java version. You're no longer allowed to deploy due to corporate compliance. Uh, rules and so uh, yeah in the end we are more or less running the system blindfold uh, due to lack of storage management uh, or sensible storage management uh, and we were also stuck on the OS and Luster side because of performance issues as I said uh, the system was based on MD RAID and when we uh, after uh, after Sun was acquired uh, or taken over by Oracle and uh, Luster moved on to WAM Cloud, when we first tried to deploy a WAM Cloud patch kernel, uh, I think it was 1.8.7, the WAM Cloud version, uh, our OSTs immediately blew up and crashed within like an hour or two of operation. And 
it's been a few years, but I think this was due to some MD rate patches that were part of the Sun kernel, but not um, of the WAM cloud kernel. And so since this was uh, a production system, we essentially uh, locked the systems down on Luster 1.8.5, so the last public Sun version uh, that still run, ran mostly stable. And yeah, we were stuck at that version, basically. So uh, now with uh, the end of life of this Luster system, um, the idea was to, to take the existing storage, the idea by the customer, to reuse the storage and the server hardware as a scratch file system. And, but uh, on the other hand, we really didn't want to, to drag on this Luster 1.8 based installation forever. Um, and it was also based, of course, on, uh, on EL5. We wanted to upgrade to a current OS, to a current Luster version. Uh, we wanted to very much avoid the MD rate layer that was giving us lots of trouble. Um, we wanted to avoid JBot management because, uh, well, we couldn't essentially run it anymore. And of course, we wanted to increase drive redundancy as much as possible because uh, experience had shown uh, the hardware to fail really, really often. So uh, in the end, this was a nice playground to start from scratch to um, to deploy uh, a new Luster file system on well-known existing hardware. And we thought it was uh, a nice fit uh, to use a CFS backend uh, on the system. So we chose uh, Luster 2.5.3, then still believed to be uh, within a maintenance stream, and um, put a CFS backend uh, behind it. And because of the, the drive stability, issues, uh, I went with as much re redundancy as I could get, so uh, we went for RAID C3 in 8 plus 3 VDEVs. And uh, along this way, when, we, when you get the possibility to, to rebuild a, an existing sy system from scratch, you also try to learn from previous installations and apply over overall improvements that are uh, not specifically tied to CFS or to Luster or the upgrade to Luster version. And I'll try to tell you about uh, all of these different aspects. So uh, first, let's look at how administration and maintenance of the system as a whole has changed. Um, yeah, deployment and regular maintenance. Um, first, uh, first item. Um, of course, the nice thing about CFS is that uh, it doesn't require kernel patches, and this really facilitates regular maintenance a lot. Um, we're operating this in a corporate environment where we have strict security rules. I think it's, it will be the same in, um, at many other sites as well. And uh, we're obliged to, to apply regular security updates to a running OS version, and uh, this always was, or still is, troublesome on Luster servers that are based on LDISCFS because uh, the kernel patches, uh, they just can't be uh, forward ported with, uh, with minimal overhead, and uh, so uh, they always lag behind the latest OS versions as released by Red Hat, for example, and uh, this is uh, way more convenient when using a CFS-based installation because uh, you don't have any kernel patches. You just uh, you have to deploy uh, the Luster-specific modules and uh, the SPL and the CFS layer. And those are uh, conveniently distributed as uh, DKMS-enabled modules. So what you basically end up with is uh, you just yum upgrade to a new kernel version, to a new security patch as released by Red Hat, uh, you reboot, maybe rebuild uh, your Luster modules, uh, uh, and this is basically it. This is uh, a way more convenient situation than before. Um, yeah, one thing uh, I had to do during initial deployment, uh, the day, the very day I set up the system, uh, CFS 1.6.4 was released, but uh, it was incompatible with uh, Luster 2.5.3, so uh, I had to, uh, and backport for 1.6.4 was in some later Luster branch, 
So I had to go and backport this to the 2.5 uh, tree. It's, uh, it's up on JIRA. Um, the, the JIRA ticket ID given is um, for the main backports. Uh, there should be a second ID linked from this one uh, for the 2.5 uh, version if someone really wants to use this. Um, so this was really the main overhead during deployment uh, that we had to do. Um, how did we go about uh, setting up the system? First of all, uh, we created our C pools, um, set up our, our VDEVs, uh, tested uh, the, the rate, uh, rate C redundancy uh, using uh, a temporary ordinary CFS file system. So uh, we did some initial tests just using the POSIX layer. And uh, then once the, the initial testing was complete, uh, we were satisfied uh, with uh, the characteristics we just set, uh, this test file system, and didn't forget to set uh, property can mount equals off, so we didn't leave a stray uh, uh, CFS file system uh, mounted, and just went off and created the Luster backend file system. So we didn't uh, just use uh, the MakeFS Luster feature to, to do this all in one go, so we took more of a step-by-step -step approach. Um, talking about stability, um, the system has been open to, to some of our power users for a couple of months. They've been pounding the system, uh, and uh, so we have some uh, some kind of data in terms of stability. So far, it worked out quite nicely. Uh, formally, I have to say it's only in production since yesterday uh, to the general public. Um, but I think the worst offenders uh, uh, they are they are operating on the system for quite some time now, and I think it's still up and running. Let me just check. I think it's okay now. <laughs> um, during deployment, uh, experiences didn't look so promising initially because, uh, well, when I set this up, uh, 063 uh, was still the current version. And uh, I set up the system. The first thing I did was run an IO test on the POSIX layer. And uh, the system went out of memory within like 10 seconds. Uh, and this was uh, very much repeatable, so uh, it was a really fast way to crash the system, and I wasn't really convinced um, that, uh, that this was really a system I wanted to put into production. Um, pr the troublemaker was the IIO zone rewrite test, which has uh, quite, a, quite a peculiar um, IO pattern, where it's uh, just overwriting the same block of, uh, of at the, at the beginning of the file over and over and over again, uh, several gigabytes of data worth. And uh, so this is a pretty abnormal usage pattern and uh, CFS 063 didn't really like it. Um, and luckily this was fixed in, uh, in 064, which was just released the very day. So uh, it was a really easy fix, just upgrade to the new version and be done. Uh, next thing we noted uh, was that uh, once we put the CFS-based luster system into production, uh, some of our clients kept crashing. And uh, we finally tracked this down to a well-known luster bug, uh, 5150, which was also seen occasionally on LDISC FS, and it uh, was due to some uh, empty ACLs stored on, um, stored on Luster that are usually filtered out by LDISC FS, and so you, you really have to have trouble to create these kinds of entries with an LDISC FS based setup because uh, at the LDISC FS layer, uh, it makes sure that they never show up to the client, but the same uh, restrictions aren't in operation when you're going CFS based. And so it's far easier to run into this particular bug um, with CFS, and apparently not that many uh, folks have seen it so far. Uh, it had already um, been fixed. It was an easy fix to backport, um, but well, this is uh, yeah, this is some of the, uh, it's one of these issues that you run into um, 
when you're trying out something new. This is not really a problem that is due to CFS. It's more of a problem that was uncovered by CFS, but that was already present uh, in the previous uh, Luster code base. It was just shadowed by some other mechanism. Um, okay, talking about stability, I said the hardware was quite wacky. Um, and it was known to, to fail in spectacular ways many, many times. Once we put CFS on it, um, CFS immediately detected uh, a multitude of faulty drives uh, within the pools uh, that were previously undetected or at least unidentified by MD RAID. And uh, so uh, we're essentially were running on defective hardware. We just didn't know which part of the hardware uh, did have the defects. And with CFS, it was really easy. And it's all, I might add, it's also easy to, to go uh, to your hardware vendor to, uh, to open a support ticket and say, okay, CFS has found a checksum error on this drive, please replace it. And uh, this is far easier and uh, uh, yeah, it leads to the desired response uh, in a much easier fashion than going to your hardware vendor and saying, uh, we see some kind of uh, issues with MD rate. Uh, drives keep falling off the system and um, we don't have any clear error messages. I think this is this drive, please replace it. Um, of course, this leads to lengthy discussions with support and firmware update this and uh, unplug that. Uh, so it, it's, it went much in a much smoother way once we we deployed the CFS-based solution. Okay, talking about working with JBot storage. So this is nothing really CFS-based, but uh, CFS enables you to use JBot storage in a sensible manner. Uh, those are the things we learned when using JBot storage. Uh, first of all, uh, Due to the upgrade to, from Luster 1.8, uh, which we were stuck with, to Luster 2.5, we were also able to upgrade from Red Hat EL5 to EL6 or CentOS 5 to CentOS 6. And uh, we immediately noticed that there's life beyond crappy Java management tools uh, when working with JBots, when working with external enclosures, uh, we discovered that there are standard tools and even a SCSI standard for talking to these storage enclosures so you don't have to use this crappy uh, Java tools. Um, there's uh, uh, SG3 utils, uh, comes with commands SG sesh and uh, there's even uh, a sysfs directory sysclass enclosure uh, that nicely lists all your enclosures and uh, maps the physical slot within the enclosure to the matching def SD whatever. And this really is a lifesaver when, uh, when dealing with 100, 150 uh, SCSI devices in different enclosures. Um, also, being able to just uh, turn on the steering locator from the OS and not having to go to uh, an external Java tool uh, makes things much, much smoother when dealing with day-to-day -day operations. And the most common thing you have to do um, in large storage systems is dealing with drive failures and uh, dealing with disk replacements. So this was something we learned along the way uh, that uh, in terms of uh, naming our drives, um, we, uh, we previously, uh, we thought uh, maybe we can go the Solaris route and try to map enclosure controller uh, storage linkage information into the drive name. Uh, nowadays, what we do is we use this nice facility provided by CFS uh, to, to give alias names, def disk by VDEF, whatever. And in this uh, arbitrary by VDEF name, we just include, in, include the enclosure number, the slot number, and I think even the hardware serial number. So when a drive fails, CFS will send us an email 
uh, and this email already contains all the necessary information we need to open a ticket with uh, the hardware vendor. This is by far the most frequent uh, administrative task we have to do and I think uh, it's quite useful uh, to encode this information, the most frequently used information within the drive name. Um, yeah, one other thing that's nice about CFS, of course, when you uh, deal with drive failures, uh, the impact from resilvering is much, much lower uh, compared to MD Ray because uh, the CFS pool and the C pool knows uh, which part of the disk was in use and just has to restore part of the part of the drive instead of MD, MD Ray, which usually just uh, restores the whole of the drive. Okay, now. Uh, talking about high availability, we integrated Pacemaker, uh, the system into Pacemaker, and we could have used just the regular Luster init script provided by the Luster distribution, but we wanted to have a more fine-grained uh, set of resources, so we built um, individual resources for the C pools uh, and Luster targets, which meant uh, we had to uh, customize a few scripts uh, we have a dedicated um, pacemaker resource script for the C pool, uh, which I grabbed from somewhere on the internet. Uh, the important thing is uh, to, to tell the script to uh, import with cache file equals none, so uh, we wanted to always rescan all of the drives uh, once uh, uh, the C pool starts up, because after failover and this might have changed. And the one thing compared to LDISC FS um, that's a little troublesome for us is um, with LDISC FS, it's really easy to set up a high availability configuration due to the fact that LDISC FS provides this uh, multiple mount protection and that uh, so we can uh, run without need for, for formal, uh, formal fencing. And there is no such equivalent uh, within a C pool, unfortunately, until now. Uh, so we really have to uh, to configure a fencing device. And well, due to circumstances, this wasn't available to us, so we're quite limited at this front so far. Uh, we don't have really automated failover um, because of the lack of fencing uh, right now. This will probably not be uh, an issue in uh, in the general case. And okay, in the, uh, the file system resource script, we also had to employ a, a little modification because uh, the file system script usually uh, it expects uh, a block device as the source and it doesn't uh, understand when you give it a CFS pool syntax, so something like tank slash uh, luster one, uh, OST one, whatever. Uh, it trips over this and doesn't know how to deal with it. It was a simple modification within the script that was required. Okay, so um, this was the basic setup. Of course, when you operate a CFS file system uh, as an admin, you know at some point or later uh, things will start to break. So it's quite good practice to know, uh, to dig a little bit into the bowels of the file system to get a feel for how it operates and how you can debug the file system uh, if the need arises. Um, with uh, LDFSCFS, I believe uh, many of us have become familiar with uh, the tool called DebugFS. And with CFS, there's uh, something called CDB, which is almost but not quite entirely unlike DebugFS. And this is the tool for under the hood debugging of CFS CPOL internals. Um, the most annoying thing about CDB uh, is its user interface. And I think uh, someone invented a regular set of human readable command line options and then deployed a Huffman code uh, on it uh, on top of a Morse alphabet. So uh, when you really want to dig uh, into inode information, what you do is cdb minus d d d d d d uh, or minus b b b b b b um, and well the thing you need to come over uh, mentally is that 
once you type these kinds of command lines, you're not trying to uncover some Easter egg within CDB, but this is perfectly normal usage. And uh, of course, CDB minus DDDD uh, is not to be mistaken with CDB minus DDDD. <laughs> Let me give you an example. So uh, what we want to do now is uh, find the physical location of uh, the data stored in file X. So the first thing we do is uh, we try to obtain its inode number. We can just use regular LS for this. Uh, and we have inode number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, then we go CDB minus DDDD. Uh, we give uh, the name of the CFS data set, uh, tank slash FS1, and then the inode number. And then it spits out a large uh, chunk of data. And uh, let me just go through a few select parts of it. Well, you see the size, uh, number of objects, uh, you see that uh, metadata is replicated. And yeah, uh, the two things highlighted, uh, those are the, uh, the virtual addresses um, where uh, the file data, uh, not the metadata, is actually stored. Um, it gives uh, the number of the virtual device, uh, its offset within the device, and uh, the physical size. So um, this gives, it, uh, gives us uh, a certain hint where our, on disk our data made, might actually reside. Um, but uh, we what we uh, really want to know is find the exact blocks uh, on our uh, on our individual drives, and uh, unfortunately, this is uh, n not such an easy task. Um, it's quite s easy if you use simple VDEFs like a single drive or a mirror. Uh, then you just have to subtract the header size from the offset and divide by the block size. Uh, but uh, with RAID C, uh, I've tried to read uh, up on on uh, yeah many many CFS resources, um, but didn't really come to a conclusive answer. Other than RAID C is strange with its dynamic stripe stripe sizes, and I think uh, the only definitive resource right now is to go and read the source code. Uh, which is also not quite easy if you're uh, starting from scratch and just start to look at one specific function and uh, try to understand how the thing works. Uh, so um, sort of a dead end route here. Uh, the other thing I found out is uh, CDB has a command with uh, surprisingly few options um, to just read out uh, specific parts of the file, you just give it the DVA uh, with uh, option minus uh, capital R and it will read back uh, its contents, um, but this will only work if your CPool is still working. Um, if you have a test system that you can export, uh, you can cheat a little bit and just S trace CDB, uh, run it on an exported pool and see where it tries to access the data and sort of use this to analyze disk accesses, but uh, well, this is sort of che cheating. So yeah, it was uh, a little bit of a dead end route, really digging into the bowels of the file system. So in the end, I decided uh, to go a different route because uh, I wanted also to evaluate performance uh, of the system. So uh, why not go uh, ahead and just try to run uh, different benchmarks different I.O. patterns and see uh, how the system operates. So not dig into the bowels, just try uh, and see how it behaves. Um, so we wanted to study performance of the Luster client related to the performance uh, of the CPL on, on the local FS and uh, yeah, see how it reacts to different I.O. patterns. Now uh, we of course have to relate this to uh, the performance of the the disk hardware that's within our systems. And as we all know, this is quite sensitive to, to I.O. patterns. Uh, HDDs are known uh, to perform well in sequential patterns. Uh, they are not uh, so optimal for a random I.O. But the thing is, 
what is random I.O. Uh, in terms of uh, as far as hard drives are concerned and what is sequential I.O. Um, so this is the typical curve you'll see when you run a benchmark on, on a single HDD with uh, random I.O. in different block sizes, different unit sizes. Um, and of course you want to get the max out of your hard drives uh, in terms of throughput, so you want to stay uh, into the right region in the right region as much as possible. And uh, so you want to determine this, for the want of a better name, I called it characteristic block size, uh, where, where throughput is really optimal. So we have bulk I.O. to the right of this characteristic size, random I.O. to the left of it. And uh, in fact, all you need to obtain this characteristic size is a look in, into the data sheet of the, your hard drive. Uh, our disks, they were, uh, had a one terabyte capacity, a 7,200 RPM, uh, a documented seek latency of one to nine milliseconds, and a sequential throughput of 90 megabytes per second. So um, from this, we can calculate a maximum rotational latency of, and that's one over uh, the, the spinning rate, 8.3 milliseconds, and uh, so uh, this yields a maximum random IOPS value of one second over seek uh, latency plus a half the rotational latency on average, or 79 IOPS. And if uh, we uh, use this, the maximum throughput divided by the random IOPS number, we end at this characteristic IO size, which for our disk is 1.1 uh, megabytes. Uh, so this means, um, if we drive the disk with uh, one megabyte IOs or 1.1 megabyte IOs or higher, we, with random IO of chunks of one megabyte or higher, we are in the bulk region, so we should expect maximum throughput, whereas with uh, larger IO, random IO sizes, we are in the IOPS bound region and we won't be able to obtain maximum throughput. And uh, we use this in 8 plus 3 RAID C setups. So uh, for a RAID C set, uh, this number actually uh, multiplies by 8. So we should see something happening in, in the benchmarks at uh, block sizes of 8.8 .8 megabytes. And we also should uh, take into account that the interconnect limit uh, might uh, have a role in this and uh, the system might saturate earlier. So this is what we end up with, and there are a few remarkable things. Um, the one line is the backward read, uh, which really um, essentially tests uh, due to the way, uh, I, this is an I.O. zone run, and due to the order of tests I.O. zone runs, um, the, the backward read is actually the one that tests the read speed. Um, in terms of IOPS, and we really see it approaching uh, the sequential throughput at uh, around about between four and eight megabytes. Uh, we really see crappy random read performance, um, and uh, I don't have a good explanation why uh, random reads should be so low, uh, especially if we compare with backward read, which um, is a sequential read over a randomly written file, so, all, so should uh, represent uh, a random value. Uh, I can't really explain the difference. Uh, what you also have to take into account is the difference between uh, read speed and write speed. Uh, because we're using JBots, um, we have uh, in a rate C, 8 plus 3, we have to uh, write uh, to 11 disks, but we read from 8 disks. So the interconnect saturation um, kicks in. Uh, at, uh, at a different limit, so we obtain a higher read speed uh, than a write speed. And uh, looking at how this changes if we run it from a Luster client, um, the one remarkable thing is uh, at the very left we see significant read modify write overhead uh, when we uh, run on a local CFS file system, and this read modify write overhead is nicely glossed over by the Luster client at really small block sizes, smaller than the record size of the file system. Uh, 
it's still not optimal, but it's way better than the local file system. Other than that, what we see is that uh, last 2.5 single stream performance really crappy. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I mentioned most of what I wanted to say. Here, uh, we also re did run a couple of other benchmarks, but they were farther, uh, rather boring. Uh, well, IOR, write speed, gets us to the max of the interconnect. This is uh, really not a big surprise. Um, to summarize, uh, CFS and uh, the accompanying OS update provided stable configuration on previously unstable hardware. Uh, CFS is well suited for JBot storage um, and the performance, well, it met our expectations. So that's it for now. Thanks. That's a very cool feature, yeah. thanks. So your analysis of MD RAID, was that entirely based on the 2007 vintage MD RAID, or did you take a fresh look at that? Uh, sorry, once again. So you're comparing, so you wanted to move to ZFS because of your bad experience with MD RAID, but that was based maybe on a 2000 Um, yeah, so we were running this on Red Hat EL5 uh, OS. I think much of the problems that we were seeing were probably not due to MD RAID itself. They may have been due to driver issues in, uh, in EL5. But uh, the end result was uh, we saw our MD RAID sets crashing. And uh, so in the end, uh, yeah. Uh, it showed up as an MD rate problem to us, but uh, with newer versions, uh, things will certainly have improved. Uh, no doubt, of, no doubt about that. Yeah, what we saw was uh, uh, behavior that disks would just drop out of the array were no longer visible. Uh, as def sd whatever, uh, but a different def sd a was also visible as def sd b without any multipathing involved. So this was really strange behavior. Uh, 